Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Chris Bircher. This is the Neurodivergent Professor. Podcasting, doing YouTube videos, writing on a website called Medium, and on my personal website, www.chrisbircher.com. About all things different. Focus on the metaphysical over the physical. Things you don't really see uh, talked about that much. I'm part of a a movement, I think, of lots of different people. And if you found me, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Writing about personal growth and mental health and psychology and philosophy and ecology and how all these things sort of interact, sociology, anthropology, to, 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 to be part of this change, the shift, in a new direction for humanity, a new direction for our planet, you know, um, toward cooperation and kindness and social justice and and being good stewards of the planet and sort of releasing our connectivity to outdated values like money, status, and power. Um, it, like I said, if you're here, you know what I'm talking about. And I'm one of the many voices that is talking about this stuff. And I'm really, what I want more than anything is to interact with this group of people and to be part of it and find that community, build off of each other, help each other, you know, get ideas from one another, influence each other's thinking as part of this machine, this system of change that is inevitable, as Thanos says. It's inevitable, right? This is the Neurodivergent Professor, episode 176. Is this a testable personal growth hypothesis? All right, before I get to what the Hypotheses, hypotheses are that I want to test. I need to do a little bit of background, and I've done this a couple times on the show. My background is in ecology and evolutionary biology, so I learned how to be a scientist. And one of the things that I learned in, in, in learning myself and then having to teach other people about this is most people really don't know what science is. Uh, and science is a couple of different things, really. And I, and I haven't talked about this too much, but there's experimental science, which is what I want to talk about today. And then there's just sort of like research and thinking science. And I always like to say, you know, Einstein wasn't really a scientist. Einstein was a thinker. He thought in a scientific way, and he thought about science. But that doesn't make him a scientist. You know, to me, scientists are just people who do experiments. Um, and then the other people are sort of these philosophical, socio, you know, science-like people, right? We don't necessarily have to do science to be a part of science. And that goes both ways. Um, there's good thought science, like Einstein, some of the best. And then there's bad experimental science, <laughs> And so anyway, but one of the things we don't know about is what hypotheses are, what experiments are, how do we do science? And generally speaking, I'll just try to be brief about this. <laughs> Again, somebody told me, I'm just telling you what they told me. I'm not trying to be smart and pontificate. I just need to explain this, get the, get the record straight so you know from, from, from where I'm building this personal growth test I want to do. You have a question. You're curious about something. You want to solve a problem. Or maybe you just genuinely want to know how things work. And so you have that question and you go, well, how do I ask this question in a scientific way? The way you ask a question in a scientific way is to develop a set of hypotheses that can be tested by doing an experiment, converting measurements and observations of the world into numbers, doing a mathematical and statistical analysis of those numbers, and then converting the results from that statistical analysis of the numbers back into the terms of your hypothesis. Isn't that funny? So we're dumbing the world down to numbers, which can be tested in a non-biased kind of way using mathematical algorithms, you know, formulas, like regression and ANOVA, testing for differences and looking for things. And then we go based on what these this math says, Based on those numbers, you got to reconvert them back into meaning, like words and sentences. <laughs> you know, what does the fish, how does the fish really react? Do they die? Do they stop moving? Do they reproduce better? Like, what happens with just based on that three? What is, three is not six. Okay. What does that mean in fish terms? And then you can reach, a, basically in the end, you either you either fail to reject your hypothesis or you have support for your null hypothesis. Okay, well, what are those? That's what I want to talk about. Last thing before I get to the real meat of today's episode. When you ask that question, you have to split it up into two hypotheses. You don't test a hypothesis. You test two hypotheses. The alternate hypothesis, which is what you, what you think, and then a null hypothesis, which is kind of like, what if what you think isn't real or doesn't affect anything? 
right? That's your HO. So you got HA, alternate hypothesis, HO, the null hypothesis. Your null hypothesis is always like this thing that you think has no effect, actually. It doesn't do anything. And so it's not, it's not doing anything. Like maybe you think, I think Snickers bars cure cancer. Well, your null hypothesis would be a Snickers bar has no effect on cancer. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't do anything. It's not even playing part of the role. Don't think about this anymore. Stop asking the question. <laughs> but your alternate might be, I think Snickers bars cure cancer. But if you really want to get down to a specifics and have a better hypothesis, it helps you to think, and you can't always make it work like this, of a hypothesis, an alternate hypothesis, as an if then because statement, because you're basically saying why you think this is. You're kind of taking your question, your thought, and saying, I think this might be real, and I'm going to go test it. So you might say something like, uh, if a patient that has cancer and eats, eats a Snickers bar, then their cancer will go away because Snickers bar has a deleterious effect on the cancer. If, then, because, Right. Uh, okay, hopefully that's enough. And so we always have a, that. And then in the end, you might have evidence that says, does this evidence support or fail? You, you know, can you reject your null hypothesis that there was no effect? And then that just means, okay, if you, you either reject your null or you fail to reject your null based on the numbers and the evidence. If you reject it, you go, well, it seems like there's an effect. It might be what I said. My alternate hypothesis, it might be that sticker sparks do affect cancer. It might not be, right? This is where we go wrong. All we do is reject or fail to reject the null. If we fail to reject the null, we say we didn't have enough evidence that sticker sparks had anything to do with cancer. Therefore, it appears as though the null hypothesis that says there's no effect of sticker sparks on cancer is real. Not that it's true, not that we proved anything. Think about how soft and weak that is. And yet we go, this guy proved this. Bullshit. Anyway, so I think it would be fun to put a personal growth spin on this idea because I do think this may be a testable hypothesis in the realm of personal growth because this is where I have arrived as of late. And if you saw my last episode uh, about reincarnation being true, it's all related to this this idea, this thing that I need to test, this idea. And, 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 and so my question is, what are we doing with personal growth? We want to better ourselves. And then I think there's this, self-actualization phase where we sort of say Maslow originally said we've reached the pinnacle of our personal growth and we've we're enlightened or we've achieved something or we're good and patient and I don't know uh, non-attached but in reality I think there's another element we can because we are a connected community and we really are kind of one life across the universe, plants, animals, think our ancestors, our future generations. I believe that. I, I, and in order to believe that, you kind of want to test that. And if that's true, then there's some responsibility to connect our change and enlightenment to other people. Be, and I think that's helping. And all of the world's religions have some element of taking what we learned and sharing it with other people. Now, I don't think we should do like we do missions and fly Christians to Vanuatu and be like, ooh, your 5,000-year-old spiritual beliefs are dumb. Let's try Catholicism or whatever. That's not what I mean. I just mean if there are people who have identified that they are curious and interested in the information that you have, then there's like a, a loving type of meaningful interaction that can occur to help them speed up, like a mentorship relationship, right? At all different scales, together. I really just think that that ought to be how we do things rather than these individual pursuits of, you know, it's personal growth, right? It ought to be like extra per personal growth too. And so that's, that's part of it. Um, and the other part of it is, I guess my thoughts are that this lack of self and interpersonal knowledge or growth or comfort or non-attachment or whatever it is, enlightenment is the cause of our problems. We've gotten so far away from connectivity and so isolated in our rugged individualism that we created 
all the problems that we have, and that there is this one sort of, this is the ultimate source of suffering, the extra suffering in war and suicide and anxiety and depression and inequality and all of those things. And that, that the pathway to solving those problems is to get our shit together and then get together and get each other's shit together. And then that will trickle up. Okay. Now, how do I, how do I test this? That's a great idea, right? And so that's why I'm doing this episode is what if I formalized this thought and sort of declared I'm pursuing this through research and the gathering of evidence that will either pass through the filter or not. I will either reject my null hypothesis or fail to reject my null hypothesis by exploring these things. Now, I can't go into a laboratory, put on a white coat, get out a bunch of test tubes and start applying treatments in a, in a laboratory experiment, right? But I can do the next best thing with this hypothesis. Okay, so the null hypothesis in this case would basically be Nurturing ourselves and or each other will have no effect on the state of the world's problems because we're all at different awareness points or something like that. But maybe that'll change. I'm not really sure how I like that. Let's try introducing an alternate or a, my hypothesis, the, uh, the alternate hypothesis, which says if we can nurture our individual self awareness. In our individual selves, self-awareness, then we can nurture it among and between ourselves and each other, which will then trickle up to solve the world's problems because self-awareness or lack thereof is the cause of the problems. Okay, so that's a lot. Remember the if, then, because. So I guess I'm thinking... The lack of self-awareness and intro self-awareness or enlightenment or whatever you want to call that, I don't even have the good words for it, is the cause of all of these problems. And remember, the umbrella for problems are things like suicide, anxiety, depression, war, inequality. So if somehow this personal growth, if we can nurture our individual self-awareness, then we can do that same thing. If we can do it for ourselves, we can do it for each other. And then this spiraling movement of enhancing each other's awareness will trickle up through the hierarchy of society and family and schools and politics and government to reach some critical threshold of self-awareness, again, the umbrella for all this other good stuff, that will change the way we do business, right? So let's say that again. If we can nurture our individual self-awareness. Then we can nurture it in each other, amongst and between people. And that self-awareness will trickle up through society to solve the world's problems because self-awareness or the lack there, the lack of self-awareness is the cause of all the world's problems or self-awareness is the solution. And again, the null hypothesis would say, if we can nurture self-awareness amongst ourselves and each other, it will have, that will have no effect on the world's problems. Okay, that's doable, right? That's a thing. I like that. So what? I mean, all, <laughs> all that does is sort of officialize or scientificize <laughs> you know, what I think we're trying to do. And I'm not sure that that helps or, or, or harms, but when I just sort of find myself rambling around going, what is it that I think is happening? This is it. I really think, and I've said this in many episodes, especially like if you go back and listen to maybe the last 20 or 30 from six months or so where I really started getting into the neurodivergent thing, it comes down to self-awareness. We're not, so, what we're doing right now isn't working. And so part of this hypothesis assumes that anybody listening to this is interested in addressing problems. And isn't, that what's happening to some degree. The problem is we're address the problem is that we're addressing these problems at the at the wrong end. I talked about this before too. We're not going far enough upstream. We're putting a band-aid on the bleeding, and we're not really understanding that the problem is that we're playing with a lawnmower all the time. 
right? Maybe we ought to stop playing with a lawnmower and that'll stop the cuts. That's the real solution to the problem. And so I'm pinpointing the solution to the problem or the cause of the problem is a lack of self-awareness. That lack of self-awareness is the, is the cause of having shitty values, valuing things like money, status, and power. That's because we haven't thought about it. These, this, this adherence to these strict fundamental religious beliefs that are causing wars and disagreements in the world, it's because we haven't really thought about it. We've just subscribed to the dogma without question, without thought, without an awareness of us doing it. It's like non-consensual. Again, lack of self-awareness. We're forgetting what the intent of politics is and fighting over oil is missing the point of the whole thing. It, it's, it's, it, it's so far away from awareness. <laughs> you know, we wouldn't be doing this stupid shit if we, were, if we thought about what we were doing. It's almost like the intent is gone. The intent now is just to gain money, power, or status. I don't know when those... You know, I don't think... Those are the pinnacle of evolutionary um, uh, derivation, right? That is not the that, that is not what humans' mo is. That's not our goal, you know. That is not the crowning achievement of our nervous system. That is so amazing to say. Oh, we can be greedy and gluttonous and abuse power and like just hoard shit and and ha- and hoard power over other people and have these drastically unequal. That's not. And a crowning achievement of evolution. That's nothing to be proud of. That might have been a step along the way. You know, violence and competition and rape. You know, all those are, 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 are acceptable steps along our evolution from primates to whatever we are now and the complexities of our brain. But that's not, where we're, that's not where we're supposed to go. And I think if we were aware of that and we thought about that in the context and we actually said, you know, it's stupid to say I can't be monogamous because of millions of years of evolution. Because our brains are the result of that millions of years of evolution. And our brains give us the ability to form cultural norms that include systems like monogamy. That actually say you can do that. <laughs> Maybe none of our ancestors did, but we're different. But if you don't think about that, if you're not aware of that, you can't put it in any context because you're blinded by thinking about pursuing power, money, and status. And so at some fundamental level, I think without self-awareness, you can't solve any of these problems. So we got to, that's the, at some point way upstream, there's a responsibility for the power that is our amazingly capable nervous system and to steward that capacity into the future in a way that honors the ancestors that came before that allowed it to happen, right? Instead of like just recklessly, abusing the, 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 the capacity for hierarchical control or the abuse of power, right? I mean, that's not the best use of that ability. <laughs> the best use of that ability would be to try to like elevate everyone and to like distribute kindness kind of equitably across the world so that there would be joy. Like that seems to be a, a, that, that, that cannot be part of the system. We wouldn't feel good things if they weren't, there weren't the potential for that to be uh, the carrot that we're chasing. Right? And, I'm not, and I'm not saying we should just all be um, org- orgasming all the time. I'm just talking about ba- a, basic, a basic calm peace. These are, these are values that are more righteous or more um, valuable or meaningful, appreciative of what we have than simply fighting about stuff and competing. You know, and, and, the, and probably the simplest example of that is cooperation versus competition. Both of those things were important elements in governing our evolution and natural selection. People that cooperated in family units and cultural norms and things like that became more successful, so cooperation was selected for. Unfortunately, competition also worked, and people that clubbed women over the heads reproduced more than people that didn't, and people that took over you know, kingdoms and killed people and became powerful, those also advanced too. But at this point, of who we are as humans, our capacity allows us to make a choice. And I don't think, depending on your value system, I don't think many people, unless you subscribe to the money, power, status 
value system are going to choose competition as the best way to move forward. We solve way more problems with cooperation than we do with competition. Therefore, it is better. <laughs> and that's the sort of thing. And in order to get there, we have to be self-aware. And then there's a step, of course, a series of steps that is inherent in this hypothesis. It isn't as simple as being self-aware. The point is that self-awareness is the beginning of your personal growth trip. And that goes through some series that's not fully developed with me yet, but other people have taken healthy stabs at this, of things that you do to get to a more derived and um, commensurate and appropriate value system that better drives the human species forward and solves the problems, reduces the suffering, the unnecessary suffering, and makes us a better species. Things like taking care of our home, appreciating our ancestors, realizing that other species have the rights to live too, but don't necessarily have the power you know, realizing that we can do these things like harvest, you know, ancient sunlight in the form of fossil fuels from the earth and burn it in five minutes and make iPhones and fly to the moon. But maybe that's not the best use of that because of all the damage. Just think about shit. That's a step here. And so this is the beginning. And any, anything that I consider, like, you know, it's like, what do I want to do today? Do I want to take this job? Do I want to take that job? Do I want to talk to this person or help this person? Do I want to focus on my family? Do I want to focus on my career? Having a filter to pass these choices through that is consistent, like a value system or belief system that you've hashed out and not just been handed and, and immediately preached the gospel, like and believed and accepted, right? Something you were aware of and then processed is a very meaningful tool that allows humans in a, in a, in a you know, like think of that reincarnation in a, in a lifetime. If you have that kind of focus and you have a value system and you have made some decisions and thought about these things, now you can make decisions more rapidly because if, if a thing that you're getting ready to do does not subscribe to these predetermined things you've thought about that matter, you simply don't do it. Oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna steal that because I've decided that you know, this is one of my values, connectivity and appreciation and equanimity and equality, and that doesn't agree with that. So I'm not going to do that. I don't want to take that job because they're funded by whatever. There's something here. It's not fully developed. This is what the introduction of the idea. It's like the beginning of the, 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 the test. And so now the, the question is, how do we experimentally generate data to, to determine if there is enough evidence to either reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Because right now, it's sort of like the beginning of a class. You know, beginning of a class, you got an A. It's your A to lose. And every time you do an assignment or take a test, you know, you're going to have points that either work for or against you. It's what you're, whether or not you're earning that A. So beginning of this test, things are either going to support or refute the idea that self-awareness and personal growth can trickle up to solve the world's problems. So what am I going to do but look for these signs in the world that support the idea that self-awareness can actually lead to the development of a new human system that reduces the number of problems that we have between and amongst ourselves or individually and collectively, or doesn't? And it's, <laughs> you know, of course, it's my idea. It's a lot of people's idea, but I have a hard time thinking that I'm going to find a lot of evidence that doesn't support my hypothesis. And in the end, what's the best thing that can possibly happen that we fail to reject or that we um, don't support or reject, we reject our null hypothesis that says there's no effect. And the idea is that I think there's already enough evidence that suggests being self-aware is the beginning of the pathway to the future. Degree? Disagree? What do you think? How can we test this? What kind of evidence do you have that supports or refutes this, refutes this null hypothesis? Very curious to know. This has been episode 176. Is this a testable personal growth hypothesis? What say you? I'm Chris Bercher, the Neurodivergent Professor. I will see you next week. Take it easy.